Well, good evening, Lee. How are you going, mate? I'm good, Greg. Stuck in Melbourne, but uh, we are well and truly on the, the downhill run to being able to get out and go fishing. Yeah, on the downhill run or on the uphill run, depending how you look at it. Oh, so yeah. It's been going downhill, now it's levelling out, mate. Yeah, it's about where it's at, mate. We just need everyone to do the right thing for a couple more weeks and uh, yeah. hopefully be, it'll be, you know, back on the water. But you know what? We, we've we missed out for a, a, a long time, but saying that, thankfully, it's been through the winter months and we are right on the cusp of snapper season now. So fingers crossed we'll be on the water at the right time. Yeah, that's it. At least if you're going to come back from, uh, you know, being locked down, you're going to come back at a time when the fish might be biting and there's you know, something to go out there and chase. And perhaps the fish have had a bit of a rest as well, as we discussed in the podcast earlier today, that they might be uh, a little bit less pressured at the moment. Yeah, no doubt. Look, and I'm sure there's all that sort of stuff that comes into into play, especially, you know, these fish have had a big rest, and even the squid and, and all that sort of things. And the, the recreational catch of squid down here in Port Phillip Bay and Western Port is is huge it's actually bigger than the commercial catch so um you know all those fish come in they the squid spawn the squid breed and that makes more food makes the the wheels turn yep yep for sure so guys uh for those that have just joined us so uh, please uh you know let you make yourselves known just jump on the chat there let us know that you can hear us okay and let us know where you're coming from and what your interests are so we're going to be talking about snapper today we're going to be talking about how lee uses his simrad technology to find snapper and to target them, find the the actively feeding fish and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to focus on Port Phillip Bay and Western Port Bay down in Lee's backyard in Melbourne, which a little bit out of bounds at the moment, but not for long, hopefully, as we've just discussed. So uh, hopefully things are, are turning around. So, guys, well, what we're going to be talking about also will apply anywhere in Australia. So if you're a snapper fisher anywhere in southern Australia, a lot of this stuff is still going to be applicable. Yeah. Um, and if you've got questions specifically to other locations or well, Lee's fished all over the country, so feel free to fire those questions through. And don't feel limited either to just sonar questions. You're quite welcome yeah. to ask questions more generally about snapper fishing. Uh, With that doubt. Yeah. So Zdenko is having a few problems. The internet there is very slow. Sorry about that, mate. So we've got Kevin from Traralgon. We've got Michael from Tassie. Guy uh, has tagged a few people as well. Good on you, Guy. So we've got lots of people starting to come on board. I'm not going to go through all the names. Yep. Um, Jack says he loves the podcast today. Can't wait to hear more about the Simrad tips. So good on you, Jack. So yeah. glad a few people have heard the podcast. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we can add a little bit more on the sort of nuts and bolts of sonar and that kind of thing. So Yeah, well, hopefully, Craig. And I suppose that we spoke about it in the podcast that, I mean, there's there's something like seven different strains of snapper throughout the country, but mm. snapper are snapper. And while they, they vary from area to area, the, the basics of snapper fishing are probably, you know, very, very similar. And, you know, what we what we do down here does work in other parts of the country, you know, and, in fact, it's, it's absolutely deadly in other parts of the country. And same... Thing saying that, that one of my favourite ways to fish up the coast in New South Wales is with a floating bait. You anchor up your burley and you fish a floating bait, you know, even in, in 50 metres of water, and it's deadly because a snapper come up off the water, off the bottom, and we do the same thing down here, and it works just as well. So these tips and whatever will work for everybody everywhere. And I think as we had our, our chat for the podcast as well, mate, you were talking about the difference, and we might go through this before we even start with our sonar yeah. uh, masterclass tonight, but you were talking about the differences between Western Port Bay and Port Phillip Bay, and they're very, very different yeah. fisheries despite being geographically close together. And I said to you during the podcast interview, look, it reminds me so much of Moreton Bay, where parts of Moreton Bay are a bit like Port Phillip. It's yeah. not a lot of tidal movement, but there is a rise and fall. Other parts, you've got this roaring tidal current, and so they fish very differently. Same same snapper strain there, I believe, in that bay, but yeah. um, yeah, but but very, very different in terms of how you target them. Yeah, for sure. And that's that's a great thing. There's there's no one way to catch them. And that's what I do love about it. But you know, it's it's nice when I think you can go somewhere, Greg, and you can you can go, Hey, this worked in Port Phillip Bay mm. and I'm up here in Evans Head, but we've got a similar scenario and you know, things sort of look the same or I'm gonna try the same thing that worked down there. Same thing. You could be coming from Southwest Rocks. You know, we've got Graham Allen there. And, and tips and things that he would do at Southwest Rocks, they will work down here. So, yep. and it's cool when you can just go, oh, that, I remember that time that worked there. I'm going to throw that in and, and quite often it does work. Yeah, well, let's, before we do start off, mate, let's have a bit of a chat about your backyard. I know a lot of people that are coming in tonight are going to be very interested in the Melbourne scene. Yep. Um, but as I said, we will talk about other areas as well. But let's have a bit of a chat about Western Port, Port Phillip, because it really is a very interesting story. And I've heard it from now from a couple of different Vic anglers. And um, 
talk to us, mate, about what the differences are between those two fisheries. They're both great fisheries in the in yeah, their own right, but very they different. They really are. They're wonderful fisheries. They're very interesting fisheries too. So the majority of the fish that come into Port Phillip Bay come, you know, they, they're born in there, they go out and they head to the west, so down towards Portland and places like that. So, you know, guys know those sorts of locations. Mm. Something like 70% of the fish that come back into the bay are from that west, whereas once you start to go to western port, you get a bit of a mix, but there's definitely more of an eastern sort of strain. And then when you go down to places like Welsh Pool and Lakes Entrance, you've got a genuine eastern strain of snapper or an eastern East Gippsland strain of snapper, and they do look different. It's really quite interesting that you can see a photo of a fish and you can go, I reckon that's come out of Welsh Pool or Gippsland. Yep. Or I reckon. Yep. So, But what's interesting, Port Phillip Bay, if people don't know, it's one of the biggest bays in the world. Okay, but it's got no or minimal tide for the majority of the bay. Down in the entrance, it has a huge amount of tide, and it basically because Port Phillip Bay is round like a, a sauce, a, a, mm. a bowl, shallow on the edges, 20 odd metres deep in the middle. But when it comes to the water getting in and out, it's like pulling the plug out of the bath. So you have this tiny little entrance, which is the rip, and you have all this water trying to get in and out of there on the mm. tide changes. And on on big southerly winds it can actually bottle the water up in the bay and the bay level will actually rise because the water comes in on the running tide but can't get out properly on the run out tide so yeah. Um, yeah. makes for a very interesting piece of water you jump over the, the peninsula and it's basically this <laughs> finger of land you've got port phillip bay on one side western port on the other and you go to this completely different scenario where you've got um a long sort of channel that winds up you've got Phillip Island, or my earphone fell out. You've got Phillip Island across the front of it. There's two entrances to Western Port, one big one, one small one. And it's a tidal piece of water that's very different. It's full of sandbars and mud banks. And yeah, it's, but it's a, it's a wonderful fishery in its own right. Yeah, yeah. All right, mate. We've got a few questions already starting to come through. And I know okay. you've got a few screenshots that we can work through as well. But maybe I'll just wander back up through the questions. Thanks, guys, for everyone who's uh, chatting, by the way, and letting us know that you can hear us. That's always good because it's very difficult. When you're doing these things and you can't see the audience, you can't see the you know, read the body language, you don't know whether people are hearing you okay. So we do appreciate that. So we've got Mark Cotton. He's interested in his deep deep water snapper fishing in New Zealand, 90 metres. Wow. Um, so perhaps we could touch on some aspects yeah. of fishing in deeper water. Yeah. Um, Jack, love the podcast today. Can't wait to hear more about Simrad. Well, you're in the right place for that, Jack. Um, what have we got? Real salty fishing. South Australian no snapper for another two years. Oh, Very God. sad, but but guys, wait oh, till long term. It. It's the wait long term. You get back into it. Yeah, that's right. It's the it's you know it's a two years is a long time, but I think the the state of their fishery, um, it, it was a necessary thing to be done, and fingers crossed it, it will make it better than ever. Yeah, absolutely. And look, it is is tough. I mean, I, I do feel for you guys, but also I look over at Western Australia where there's been some fairly tough laws put in place and the quality of snapper fishing over there now is just yeah. off the planet. So plenty to look forward to there. So we've got um, Andrew Lorriman from Port Stephens who's wanting to know the best way to target snapper on slow jigs. Yeah, uh, I don't know if, if you've got any screenshots in particular that yeah. might talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we do. So the, the great thing about snapper, Greg, I think is that, you know, for, for a long time and growing up, even as a kid, you thought they were such a bottom feeding predator that mooched mm. around and didn't do a lot. They are actually the super predator, quite a super predator. Yep. You know, they're a big, strong fish with a big, strong mouth and they can eat everything from crabs and mussels and oysters off the bottom through to chasing and chowing down live slimy mackerel no problem at all in fact one of my favorite baits in gippsland is a big slimy mackerel like i'm talking not far off the size that you will use for a marlin bait yep. um and yep. when they eat them they eat them like and, and there's i remember seeing some phenomenal footage from years ago when matt watson had one of his first videos that came out of snapper fishing in new zealand and this this 20 odd they actually had underwater footage of 20 odd pound snapper just eating a live salmon and it was brutal the way they attacked them and that's just mm. how they do it they're they're quite a predator and you know with our good electronics these days mate like i have no problem at all mark and snapper sitting 10 meters from the surface in 50 meters of water so it's changed it's, it's, fish. A, uh, it's a case of realizing that they're snapper i think isn't it because yeah. i think for, for a lot yeah. of a lot of years snapper fishers would go past those fish that were sitting mid-water and they'd be targeting the stuff they could see exactly. down the bottom assuming that maybe it was kingfish or yeah. you know some other species was up higher in the water column and it's actually snapper yeah, it is exactly and they, they i think they're also a bit of a um a predator that likes to just you know they're a bit sly and he lets a lot of the fish do the other work and you'll even <laughs> see it here in the bay you get a school of salmon and they're chowing down on the bait fish on the surface and all the seagulls and all the birds are going 
and the snapper is sitting under the salmon school. And if you let your plastic or your jig sink deeper, you'll pluck a big snapper doing that. So they're a bit opportunistic as well. Um, and the great thing is that nowadays with this slow jigging, and obviously soft plastics are just phenomenal for catching snapper, especially up the coast. But jigging is just such a good thing. And there's there's a couple of factors that I really like about slow jigging. Greg is it's slow. It doesn't require a lot of effort. So <laughs> the gear you use is nice and light, so you can do it all day long. You don't have to actually worry about, you know, getting tired and all that sort of stuff. But also it's very, very good if you're driving around and you mark fish. And, in fact, I've had some great fishing up off Coffs Harbour two years ago where I was literally driving around an offshore reef system and you'd mark a ball of bait. You didn't even have to mark the fish, but if you marked a ball of bait that was tight, you know, you'd drop your jig straight down and you'd have your jig ready. You just wouldn't have your rod on. You'd literally have it in one hand driving around. Mm. You mark the bait, you prop the boat, you drop that jig down, and you got bit nearly every single time. So it's a very, very direct way of fishing, and it's a good way of dropping, obviously, the, the, the lure in this case on the fish's head, and you get that reaction bite pretty well straight away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Now, we might have a chat, more of a chat about that as we go along. I'm sure some of the screenshots will help us to explain some of what you're talking about yep. there. There's a, a question comes through from Matthew Forbes, which I think is a very good one, and it's particularly relevant, I think, to uh, Western Port Bay. But yep. he's keen to hear how you go about sounding for snapper in water that has heavy amounts of weed floating around. Yeah, well, I think we've got a couple of screenshots there, Greg. Um, should, should we go to the screenshots, mate, yeah, if that I think, helps? I think yeah. we should. Like, so these days we talk a lot about chirp. Right, so there's actually there's a jigging shot from, um, and this is a this is using slow jigs or micro jigs, and that's a whole lot of small snapper there. Um, so, but you can clearly see those little those little vertical streak lines. That's the jig working through the water, and you know that mm. you're working well when you you're doing that sort of stuff. The great thing is you can clearly target the fish. Like you can see where I'm working the jig, and like right through the fish, it's up higher in the water column at the start. Where there's not as many fish but then as as those fish are rolling through onto the right hand side of the screen i'm working the jig closer to the bottom and keeping it in front of those fish so you don't always mark your jig but when you do you know your sound is tuned right and it's, yeah, it's yep. awesome to be able to have that scenario but talking about using your sounder and how you get the best out of it in in tidal or dirty water i you know we, we talk so much about chirp and all that sort of stuff on our um our sounders these days and Simrad, the chirp, the chirp works so well with them. So what chirp's doing is throwing down multiple pulses, like really, really fast, like a machine gun in a range of frequencies. So it picks up a lot of detail. In tidal, dirty water with weed and stuff like that, it's actually often picking up too much detail. Mm, so yep. the great thing about the Simrad, especially the Evo 3, is, is you can run dual frequency. So you can run high chirp and 50 kilohertz and stuff like that and and quite often and especially in western port greg i always like to run my 50 kilohertz um and it, it's amazing how it will differentiate between the weed and the air bubbles and the sediment in the water and it will show the fish up you know and i've had days standing around going oh, no there's fishy and you're not marking them that well or you get a few scratchy marks on the on the chirp run the 50 run both of them at the same time because the chirp will also pick up stuff with the 50 or miss even 200 whatever you want to do but you know, you go to that 50 and you'll just go, bang, there's a snapper. You run your colour high as well. That's the other one I like to do, mate, in those situations is really differentiate where those those fish are in amongst anything that may be sitting in the water column. Excellent stuff. Yeah. That was actually, I, I've been correct, it was actually Matthew, um, Matthew was Forbes. it Matthew Forbes? Yes. <laughs> it was, it was uh, where are we? Matthew Jones. Ask that question. So, yeah. apologies to Matthew, Matthew Jones. Uh, thanks for the LOL, Matthew Forbes. All right, mate. Got another question here. Let me just uh, scroll through. I might just bring you back on the screen, mate. Sure. Because you're, you're a lot better looking than that screenshot. I've <laughs> haven't, had a haircut, haven't had a haircut for nearly like eight or ten weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Graham Allen's asking about the ideal depth for chasing snapper, mate. This, is a, this will be an interesting one. This is an interesting one. So, down here at home, you'll catch them in. In Western Port in November, there's a couple of mud banks that we fish and they're four metres deep. So it's really interesting. And and even there, you can still sound the snapper. If you if you drift with the tide or you're just coming really slow, come downwind, don't go upwind, so there's no slapping of the boat or anything, you'll still mark them. And it's quite amazing how many fish will get into this shallow water. And that's in four metres. Saying that, you can catch them all the way out to 100, no problem at all. You can catch them out to the edge of the shelf. So I don't think there's any set depth, but... I think, you know, anywhere you've got a reef system that comes out onto rubble bottom, 
up on the, on the coastline is good. Saying that, Greg, like I've caught a lot of snapping off Sydney casting garfish in the washes over the years. Mm. You know, so those fish are up against the rocks. So there is no set depth. There's probably the, the right time to be in the right place. And I explain this to you how we fish down here, that when it's rough, even if it's rough and you can still fish or uh, when it's rough and it's just coming off a big blow, there's no better place than be, to be in, you know, four to eight metres of water in Port Phillip Bay because the fish pushing on the edges and they get in on the bass yabbies and the crabs and that. And like, this is proven day in, day out during snapper season when the land base guys just pound big snapper off the, off the piers. So no no water too shallow, no water too deep for reds, that's for sure. And, and, and it's it not doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem to affect the size of the fish either. You can get big fish in shallow water, land based, and you can get <laughs> you can get big fish out deep off the shelf. So yes, uh, yeah, you yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just Mate, the, the interesting one too, like even you, you know, we talk about snapper and, and where they sit in the water column in South Australia. Oftentimes, they're up on the surface, feeding on mm. the surface on toads and stuff like that, and you can literally catch them on stick baits and flies and things like that. So there's no water too deep, too shallow. You know, there's there's no part of the water column the fish won't hang in. It's a matter of fishing the right way in your area. Yeah. It also depends where the bait is. You know, if the bait's up off the bottom, they have yeah. no problems whatsoever getting up under the bait, as we already already discussed. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably two of the biggest tips I could give quickly, Greg, would be mm. what I've found with snapper fishing. Um, and I, I learned this, you know, well in my younger years and up in Sydney and fishing the south coast and doing that, but while you get up on when you sounder and you mark the hard reef, right, you'll, you'll mark snapper on that, and, but you'll also mark a lot of the rubbish fish as well, and you'll catch snapper on that hard. But if you can find the, the edge where the reef comes away and it goes from reef to rubble, which is where the reef's died and, you know, so it goes to rubble and then generally out to sand, the big fish love to hang on that rubble. They, they is, sort of yeah, scout yeah. the edge of the reef. So um, you'll find the bigger fish more off to the edges. And this is a, the scenario also with mulloway, things like that. You find the edge of the reef and the drop-offs and things, and that's where they'll be. The other one is that, that's interesting is oftentimes the bigger fish sitting higher in the water column, okay? And that's for whatever reason. They're more of a predator. They can move around better. They can eat bigger bait. They can do all that. And, and this was proven very, very clearly last year in Evan's head with a, a good mate of mine, um, Sam Owen. Slug and he's an absolute gun fisherman. And I'm no gun fisherman, but I'm lucky that I know a lot of guys who are, so I get to learn a lot. And Sam, fishing with him, you always have a ball, but what you learn with these guys is, is nothing short of amazing. And we were fishing for snapper and anything from sort of 30 to 40 metres of water with plastics. And it was interesting that the earlier the in your, 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 your cast when the plastic was sinking down, so the higher the lure was in the water column, the bigger the fish were. The, the more time that plastic was in the water and the closer it got to the bottom, the smaller the fish were. Mm -hmm. So it just proved that point, and he's just said that is pretty standard up there. And we had we had it where you'd almost cast the plastic out, put in the rod holder, and you'd get eaten straight away. Like the fish are... Yep. <laughs> yeah, right. and I can I can echo that. I've seen similar situations up off the Sunshine Coast, off Barwon Banks, and places like that in 100 meters of water. The snapper is sitting in 10 meters of water. The lure hits the hits the water. You're letting yeah. it sink. You haven't even flipped the bail arm. Suddenly the line's pouring off. You flip yeah. the bail arm and it's just so tied into a big fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. That's why they're such <laughs> yeah. a good fish. I think, Greg. There's just there's so many aspects to snapper fishing. So fish many different it. aspects. Yep, yep. Yeah. mate. I'm going to go back to some of our questions. We've got a, a few of them starting to stack up here and some about the sonar as well. So we'll get onto those. So Daniel's asking about whether the sonar works well just straight out of the box, left on auto, mate, or do you have to play around with the settings? It certainly will. And that's the great thing about your SimRad gear. That is, you know, that is the wonderful thing about it. I say it every time. If you can use an iPad, an iPhone, you can use a SimRad. They work so well in, in auto, but the great thing is you can override the auto. You don't have to go into a manual setting to then change stuff you can be in auto and you can adjust your gain up and down and your, your color up and down and that's what makes them so good so um yes you can but i, I always play around with my sound always play around and i think a big one that a lot of guys don't think of greg is that they will say they'll they will set their sound in the morning or they're fishing in 12 meters of water right in the morning and then they end up out in 20 and they don't change the settings, but during the time they've gone to deeper water, the water temperature has probably changed because the sun's come up and it started to heat up or you've had a tide change. You've got all these variable factors, so always keep just playing around with the unit, just give a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And the great thing is that 
you can't break them. Okay, no. so you just you can't break them. So play around with it. If you think you know, if you mark something, go back over it and change the settings. But the other one, and I mentioned it in the podcast, Greg, is that we you know if you if you're making changes, give the sounder a few seconds just to comprehend. It's like me; yeah. it's a little bit, you know, it takes a bit for it to sink in. So. You know, just give it a couple of seconds. That's all it requires, but don't just adjust the gain and then go, no, that's no good. Adjust the gain, no, no, it's so good. And especially more so your colour and stuff, but just give it a few seconds to process and then you'll get the best picture. I think you suggested in the podcast maybe 30 seconds. Yeah, especially in deeper water. Catch up. Especially in yep. deeper water. Yeah, yeah, give it hmm. 30 seconds or so. So, yes, me, you can eat that. My kids are my kids are making the most of this opportunity, Greg, <laughs> by grabbing lollies, knowing that I'm not going to stop them and cause an argument. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, they're, they're milking it for all it's worth. Um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, so in that deeper water especially, mate, just give it a few seconds to, to let it, you know, just get that right picture, that's for sure, and, and you will so much more. If you want to go into your manual settings, then you'll get even more out of your sounder. But yep. yeah, just to start with, play around with those auto settings. Excellent. Now, a question from Matt Hanson about whether you use scent on your deep slow jigs for snapper and do you like the glow models? I do like a bit of glow on stuff for snapper. And even down here in Western Port on our bottom baits and stuff like that, I do like to run a glow bead or something like that. The other one I've been doing a lot of lately, Greg, is getting the Black Magic Snapper Snack, which is like the Snapper Snatcher. So it's a flashy attractor, but the Snapper Snack's basically got the skirt like those um, Lacanna style jigs. Oh, yeah. And yep. I, they come on a Padnoster rig and I chop them up and I put that skirt on my leader. And then that, <laughs> so that skirt then sits down just over the, the hook over and the head of yep. my bait. And they've got glow and stuff in them. So definitely mm. a bit of glow. And th there's no doubt scent works. I mean, look what gold and stuff like that does. So there's absolutely no doubt that scent works. And I do like to put a smear of, of you know, scent on my jigs, that's for sure. You know, because the, the fish, I think, they sometimes just come up and look at it. And by the tenth you bite, you often get on a slow jig. There's there's no doubt a bit of scent. And especially because you can rub it into those tinsely sort of hooks that you get on them and it stays on there quite well. Lee, just to go back a step, this I'm going to indulge my personal uh, curiosity here. But going back to the glow, I, I have the same experience with Snapper. But I, what I found is I played around with soft plastics that were the whole the whole lure was luminous, and I found yep. that I didn't get very good results with those. But just little splashes of yes. of lumo color on the on the lure work really well. Has that been your experience? Yep. I had a similar conversation with Dick Passfield about Barramundi a while back. He said the same thing. Really, you had these you had these lumo lures. Barra wouldn't touch them. He coloured most of them in black, so that he just had some Lumo patches and stripes yep. and bars and that sort of thing, and they love them. Yeah. So, yeah, is that, that the same with Snapper? Oh, I think, yeah, I think so, mate, definitely, mm. definitely. I think, mm. you know, it's as simple as a glow beat above your hook. Yep. Like just something, just that little tiny bit of L something to arouse their attention, you know. It's the yeah. same with UV, a massive on UV, and I spoke about that in the podcast. Yep. UV, Snapper, see it flat stick and and a good uv lure will just have little splashes of uv like the throat of the lure or a stripe or something like that it's not the whole lure necessarily mm. and it really does make a difference mm. Mm. excellent all right uh what do we got here another question so matt bowman is asking do you run side scan uh side scan and down scan in western yeah. port when you push up the channels yeah i certainly do i certainly do um it's just a game changer and it's a game changer for several reasons so a finding fish is one part of it, but I love it for finding the structure. And in Western Port, you're talking about kanji beds and stuff like that. And and as you're running up the channels, it's mud bottom, and there can be patches of kanji or rough bottom that are the size of your lounge room. So not overly big, you know, not overly big patches. So as you can imagine, if you're going over that in 15 or 18 metres of water, you only have to miss it by a couple of metres by your transducer, and you, you don't get nothing. You're on mud. So that side scan is absolutely amazing just to go, oh, there's some rough ground 20 metres out to the side or there's a school of snapper or anything like that. Um, and those snapper, they also, in a lot of areas, in a lot of parts of the country, you'll have channels, you know, have steep walls, and it won't matter if it's snapper or barramundi or kingfish or, you know, whatever, mangrove jacks, you run along and you can shoot your, san your sonar out to the side there and be able to see the fish sitting along the edge of the channel and stuff like that. And it's, it's such a good way to fish, that's for sure. And especially your fish moving up and down in tide too, Greg, you know, that are travelling with the water, that, that's a big help. Yeah, yeah. Now I've got a great question coming here from, um, from Mark Stewart and it's about how you tell whether fish are active and aggressive and feeding or whether they're shut down and, you know, don't bother throwing a lure at them, mate. 
Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a really good one, and you can learn a lot, and it's just time on the water that will teach you this sort of stuff. So um, obviously that the key one you want to look for and the one I, that we all get excited by um, is if you've got bait, and if that bait's stacked nice and tight and you mark a fish sitting up on it, then that's a fish that's feeding. The other one I find, though, is when you get that um, when you get that very, very, you know, perfect boomerang and it's quite steep, you know, that's generally a fish that's not moving fast, okay? The more stretched out it is, the, so the more elongated that the boomerang is, then, then probably the more that fish is moving around. Saying that, when a snapper's up in the water column he's, and there's bait nearby, there's a fair chance he's feeding in Port Phillip Bay. When they're on the bottom, um, it's very much like cows grazing on a paddock. They're just cruising around, just doing their thing. Um, so we often look for the traditional bait fishing method. You're looking for fish sitting hard on the bottom because they're there looking for scallops and mussels and crabs and, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, certainly if you can mark that sort of more flattened out arch then there's probably more chance your fish are moving around but for me greg i just love marking them sitting on bait well i love the analogy you used in the podcast today as well lee and you, you mentioned again just now that you know snapper are like cows in a paddock if they're all packed yeah. together and tight down on the bottom they're probably not feeding yep. or not not feeding aggressively if they're scattered around and you, you're moating around you're seeing one here and one there but there's a reasonable number but they're spaced out then probably yeah. they're grazing they're looking for things to eat and they're they're each marking their own little bit of territory yeah exactly it's exactly mm. yeah it does and it definitely works here look you will catch them off the big markup you know a whole pile of snappers sitting together but oftentimes you go oh get ready there's snapper everywhere here and i'm talking they sit stacked on top of each other like a school of kingfish Oftentimes you won't get a bite. Um, you know, plenty of times here, Greg, you'll, you'll mark one or two fish, you anchor the boat up in Port Phillip Bay, you cast out six rods and six rods take off. Yep. So <laughs> there's just fish in the area and they're feeding. So it's, yeah. a, it's a very, very, um, it sounds silly, but it's very much like that, mate. When you mark them all bunched together, they're like cows or sheep in a paddock that aren't happy. So yep. it's great when you mark one here and 50 metres later, one there, 100 metres, one there, because there's a bunch of fish there when that happens. But it's also a really good indication. Sonar has changed the game so much, but it's a good indication of why it's important to understand what you're looking at as well and understand the species you're targeting. Because, yeah. you know, if you were to go out there and see a pile of fish stacked up, you'd say, okay, well, this is where I'm going to fish. There's heaps of fish here. Yeah. Throw, your, throw your baits out. You could sit there all day with fish all around you and not catch anything. But by understanding the fish's behaviour and understanding what you're looking for, yes. you recognise, okay, there might be fish there, but it's not yeah. the best place to fish. And, and certainly, look, we're lucky. Well, we're sort of lucky, sort of unlucky here. We don't have a lot of species. So in Port Phillip Bay, pretty well, you either catch a snapper or a flathead. That's about mm. where it's at. Um, but up the coast, for instance, there's other species. And time on the water will even start to teach you what you're looking at. You yeah. know, um, I can, and I most people can who do a lot of it, you look at your sounder when you're marlin fishing, you can tell the difference between slimy mackerel and cow now. You can tell the difference between, you know, snapper and and rubbish fish there's so you, time on the ward will teach you that sort of stuff and mm -hmm. and that's the great thing about your simrad unit the other one is being able to screenshot greg like i refer back to my screenshots a lot which is what we're looking at tonight yep. Um, yep. screenshotting downloading those onto your computer you have a look at them you, you'll get a very very good understanding of what you're looking at just by looking at those screenshots a lot and the other the other great tip, of course, Lee, is when you are out fishing, if you're in one of those locations where you've got lots of potential species around and you pull a snapper up, then have a look back on the sounder because snapper are yes. school fish. You know, you're likely to see arches on the sounder and you'll recognise that, okay, that's what a snapper looks like on my sounder, yeah. the way I've got it set up. And that's a good way to, to be able to pick what species you're targeting. Yeah, very much, very much so, mate, that's for sure. So, um, look, time on the board is probably just your, your main thing. And the great thing is there's a there's a – so much information these days like this stuff that we're doing now the stuff that you can just get online so there's so much great info that you can get for, for doing this sort of stuff yeah so yeah. yeah it's it's a good time of it's a good period to be in mate like you know, <laughs> track, track, people used to use paper sounders to try and work out what they were doing i remember them <laughs> yeah I don't want to admit to it, but I do remember them, yeah. yeah. So let, let's move on. So uh, Stuart Rainbow is asking about moon phase and snapper yes. bite. You, you might be opening a can of worms here, Stuart. Yeah, Lots of good opinions on this one, but let's uh, let's have yours, Lee. Um, like most fishing, I like to build up to the full moon, you know, but, but not too close to the full moon. I do like the back end of the moon because you tend to get bigger tides, so you get a bit better water flow in our part of the world. So... Um, but the other one I think that, that a lot of anglers don't 
put enough emphasis on, and I'm I'm guilty of it, except for probably the last ten years, is moonrise and moonset. Mm -hmm. Okay, so quite often guys will go, oh, you know, we bang the snapper at at eleven thirty. You know, they went at eleven a.m. till you know twelve, and they just banged them. And it was the middle of the tide. Quite often that could have been a moonrise or a moonset. You know, that's a, a critical sort of thing. Um, like we we hooked a massive swordfish early this season, and and we hooked him right on the moonset at one o'clock in the afternoon. You know, it was right on the prime time to get a bite. So and it was nothing to do with the tide change. So if guys start to look at moonrise, moonset, then then that's that's a really good period. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, another question coming up. I'm going to have to read this one to you because only part of it will come up on the screen. But we've got Simon asking, he's just starting out snapper fishing uh, outside the lakes and he's looking to use his Evo 3 to build some marks that he can fish for himself. So what yep. advice would you have for a newbie who's just getting started to build up those marks? Um, again, time on the water, just try and find those key standard marks like um, off lakes entrance. You've got the pipes, you've got the grains, you've got the metum rocks, and they're all different sort of areas. Um, but again, just start to use your sound to put the time in, ask the locals for some advice. Everyone's, I fish out, it's my favourite place to snap a fish is out of lakes entrance. There's a lot of big snapper out of there. Um, and the local boys are all really, really friendly. They're really friendly blokes and they will help you out, you know, with, with getting the right info. So, and again, that's a part of the world. You start to learn what you're looking at. You know, you will know when you're marking snapper or when you're marking other fish. And in that part of the world, you're a very, very good chance of 10 kilo fish, that's for sure. So um, it's just, I would suggest just get some local knowledge. That, that's the biggest thing. Just to get that foot, you know, get that, that foot on the ground, get yourself running and, and you'll be right. The thing that I would suggest also, Simon, is that, you know, a mark is, is just a guide. You know, if you've, got a, if you've yeah. got a mark in your GPS, it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be fish there next time just because there was fish there last time. So use it as a guide, obviously build up marks. But every day you go out there, you need to use your sonar and have yeah. a look around and see what's happening. Find the bait, find the fish and all that kind of stuff. So don't just assume that when you get back to your mark that you're at last week. It's yeah. Actually, perfect example of that very quickly, Greg, is in about April every year off lakes, the snapper come in off the back of the beaches or further down to the west. And I'm talking you're fishing in 15 to 18 metres of water on pure sand. And those fish are there eating crabs and prawns. That's all they're doing. So a mark means absolutely nothing in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you get to your metan rocks, it's more like a Port Phillip Bay scenario where it's muddy bottom with probably just there's rocks on the bottom, just here, there, scattered, whatever. So there's no real structure. And yet where the fish are today, they can be half a kilometre away tomorrow. So it is a case of sounding around, keeping an eye on your sounder and, and finding the fish that way. But obviously it does give you a bit of confidence if you've got a starting point. So. I, I love a starting <laughs> point. Yeah, and, and there's, yeah. there's no doubt, Greg, it doesn't matter where in the country that I travel, if we're filming or if I'm just going fishing, if it's a new spot, I'm after a mark. And I say to guys, it, it doesn't have to be X marks the spot, but I just need a couple of starting points to then hmm. work off. And to figure it out from, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly Absolutely. what you need. Yep. All right, great question from Doug Reed. Have you tried medium chip TM uh, 185 transducer? Medium chip TM 185, no, I haven't. I've got the, because um, I've got the 175 low and 175 high wide, but I know that the TM 185s are very, very popular. There's a lot of them going around. So, um, you know, there's a lot of them on, because they, a lot of them on transfer mount transducer setup. So very popular unit that does work very, very well. However, if you're going to go into your specific deep water stuff, like your saws and your, de and your deep dropping and all that sort of stuff, you do need to look at the, the 175 load, that's for sure. All right. One from Lachlan asking about what we're looking for in the Navo Onyx maps with regards to depth and contours, mate. Um, I suppose in, in that sort of stuff, if you're talking an offshore situation, I suppose you're looking for reef systems. Um, and, and while I'm looking for the reef system, I also then want to get out there and plug out that reef system and work out where the edge of the reef system is. You want to work out, and it doesn't matter if it's snapper or whatever, you want to work out where that tide's going to be pushing into that reef system. Mm. So you're going to work out what side the fish will potentially be fishing, like sitting on. Obviously, if you've got a bit of tide or current, you want to be fishing and you and you, you want generally want to be fishing the upside of that that reef system so that your burly or your bay or your lures as you yeah, are going back towards that that area so um i look for that and that's a great thing those those mapping systems these days just fast track everything that's for sure and especially with that insight genesis stuff that's going on now too there's a lot of areas that that have just uncovered patches of reef and piles of 
structure that you didn't even know that were there. So it's it's a really good thing. Yeah. Now we've got a pile of questions here, guys, and we're going to keep going through them. We will answer all your questions before we finish the evening. And we've also got some screenshots that we haven't even started on yet. But yeah. I think it's probably, probably better to go through the questions, Lee, as they come up, because you know, sure. this is obviously what people want to know. And if there's an opportunity to switch over to the screenshots to answer one of the questions, we'll do that. So um, do we need different sonar frequencies in Port Phillip Bay versus Western Port? Uh, yeah, we, I think we do. Yeah, I think we do. And I think generally in, in um, Western Port, I do like to run dual frequency. Um, I like to run my colour higher in, port, in Western Port oftentimes to just differentiate stuff that's going on. Um, so Port Phillip, early morning and at night, at times when you get the sea lights, that's when it can be worth running dual frequency because the yeah. sea lights will kill you and the chirp just picks up every single sea light in the ocean like it's that good. So <laughs> it's really hard to see through. Um, so yeah, but but overall, look, if you just want to run high chirp, you will still mark fish and what's going on, no problem at all. But if you've got the capability to run dual, so run high chirp and at uh, fifty kilohertz or you know two hundred kilohertz, then then it's worth playing around with it. That's for sure. Excellent. Mm-hmm. You got a fan there in Misha Lee, who's ah, Misha. Uh, <laughs> been watching you for a long time. Loves what you do, <laughs> you, Misha. Can what you else? give us your thoughts, mate, on transducer banging away, putting the snapper off the bike? This is a really co- – lo- I'm, I'm glad you mm. asked this question, Brad. This is a really common Very question common. about whether the transducer scares the fish away. Um, look, for, for a lot of years, yeah, we, we would always, especially in Port Phillip Bay, stop fishing, turn the, trans- turn the sounder off um, for that reason. Um, nowadays, we tend to leave it running and you still catch plenty of fish with the – plenty of fish with the – the you know rig straight under the boat so i don't know it's almost like i wonder if and i always work on this theory too greg if i'm fishing at night i hate fishing in the dark like i'm not a person who can sit there in the dark in my boat and not be able to see anything but i work on the theory that if you've got the lights on when you start fishing and you leave the lights on it's fine the worst thing you can do is have the lights off then flick the lights on and then turn the lights off and flick them off like it's like us if we're in the dark and someone turns lights on we break out Mm. so same thing, if you turn your transducer on and off and on and off, whatever, that's probably going to have a bigger effect than if it's just sitting there pinging away, um, you know, constantly. So it, it's it's really up to you. And, look, some guys I know turn their sounder off and if they're not catching fish, they'll turn it on. And they reckon sometimes it makes them get a bite because maybe fish were sitting under the boat and it makes them scatter and move and find some baits that they potentially weren't seeing. Well, certainly if you get up on the bass lakes, you know, it's a, it's not an uncommon ploy to put your boat over the top of fish and with the sounder on yeah. and slowly motor out into deeper water and the school of fish will actually follow you and come onto the really? shoe as they come into deeper water. So it's, yeah. a, it's a tournament tactic that we've been told of a couple of times on the uh, on the Lure okay. Fishing Podcast. Yeah, that's but, interesting. Yeah, so, but, I mean, from a, from a scientific perspective, you know, what fish can hear and what they can't hear is a, quite an interesting thing. And there's a lot of frequencies, and I liken it to the, to the old dog whistle. You know, we can blow a dog whistle as hard as we like. Yep. The harder we blow it, the louder it is, but we still can't hear it. The old dog's got his paws over his head and his ears are bleeding, yeah. but we can't hear it. And there's a lot of sounds that are within our hearing range that aren't within the hearing range of fish. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of sounds, conversely, at the lower end of those frequency ranges that are audible to fish that we can't hear so and they a lot of those they feel through their lateral line so once you get down to around that 100 100 hertz sort of range so where it sits on the scale with sonar i don't know but yeah look i'm sure it has some effect on there's no doubt you know you you see it when you're marlin fishing a lot of boats with all the sounders pinging away on the bait it it definitely pushes the bait down yeah so i mean you put your hand under your transducer when it's on the trailer and you can feel it pinging away so i have no doubt the fish feel it but there's got to be something there yeah 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 yeah, and, and, and to put another example as well, you know, quite often I, I used to fish for snapper in really shallow water in Morton Bay, three, four, five metres, yep. where you drop a ball sinker on the bottom of the boat and the fish are gone, you know, just the slightest yeah. sound. You go over to Western Australia, Alan Bevan over there is pulling up 15 kilo monsters in five metres of water. And what he does is he pulls up on the reef and he bangs the side of the boat because the snapper have become accustomed to the crayfish from pulling up their pots and throwing oh. the 
the bait over the side, so they come up to the sound. So oh, I think it depends yeah. on the fish and what they're accustomed to yeah. as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Probably no easy answer to that one. So, no, there's sorry, not. Look, sorry if you haven't answered your question, Brad. We probably yeah. Sorry, Brad. We just we went around in circles on that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, I think I mean, personally, I think experiment, mate, and see what see what happens. Yeah, but, um, yeah. The biggest thing to watch, and this is a this is a hot tip for people. So these days, if you're running, yeah. Your Simrad units and your big and any sound of it. If you're running at them with big transducers and and you know all the gear, they suck a lot of power. Okay, mm. don't sit there on anchor for four hours with your sounder running. Okay, because you will flatten your batteries. Or make sure you switch over <laughs> one battery on the dash of my boat. I've got a couple of Nava battery gauge switches, and as long as the batteries are on, I can see where my battery volts are at. And then it's a really handy thing because while you're fishing, you just constantly turn around, and look at the dash, obviously look at the sounder, and you, you monitor these battery these battery volts. And it's yeah, <laughs> plenty of people, plenty of people's motors haven't started because they've left their sounders running for too yeah, long. Yeah, the battery to get home, guys. Yeah, exactly. So be aware of that. And a lot of guys fall for it when they get these. You know, they might jump out of a, a you know a smaller unit, and they finally bit the bullet and gone and bought himself like a twelve inch Simrad and a big transducer and done all that. And they don't realise the power that those things suck when they're running. So yep. keep that in mind. Absolutely. Question about barometric pressure and whether it makes a difference to fish being on the bite or not. So, Michael, that was actually something we talked about in the podcast. So I might refer yes. you back there. But, Lee, let's give him the give him the yeah. deal so right here and now. Definitely, it definitely has an effect. There is no doubt that it has an effect. And a, a high barometer gets the fish to feed well. Low barometer generally shuts them down. Um Saying that, the only time this is different, it seems, is for guys land-based fishing, you know, where the fish are in super shallow water and those fish that are there, they're there for one reason, they're there to eat. So but generally speaking, out in normal depths of water from 10 to or 12 to 50 metres of water, barometer has a huge effect. And they reckon that what it is, the low air pressure makes their swim bladders increase, so they float higher in the water column and they definitely sit high, like just sitting higher in the water column. They might be two, three, four, five metres off the bottom. And... Because their swim bladder's increased, it's pressing, keeping their stomach small. There's not the room and they don't feel full and so they don't eat and stuff like that. But then similarly when the, or at the opposite end, when the barometer starts to rise, their swim bladder decreases and then they go, oh, geez, I haven't eaten for a couple of days and that's why you tend to get a good bite. They say that you tend to get a good bite when the barometer rises. The other one that we have to find here though, Greg, is I love a nice steady climbing barometer, okay? And especially when it gets up around that 1,000 or 1,020, that's just when the fish just chew. But saying that, I've also had a, a watch where the barometer is low. Like, say, it's 1,005, right, 1,008, mm -hmm. and then it skyrockets to 120, 1,025. Like, I'm talking in a, in a matter of hours, it's up at 1,025, 1,028. That's not good for fishing either. You know, I've had plenty of times when we're all sitting there going, fish going to bite their heads off, it's going to, the barometer's going to go off. <laughs> And you just the barometer goes thousand twenty eight in six to twelve hours, and the fishing just doesn't happen. And it's maybe it's just too much pressure change. Who knows? I think but maybe the the swim bladder gets compressed, so they sink to the bottom like stones, mate. They'll just yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe, but you know, that's just one of, one more of my excuses as to why the fish didn't bite that day. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, so uh, Matt Hansen's asking, mate, what's your favourite retrieve style, mate? I reckon we might need a little bit more information on that one. So if you'd like if to let us... Talking plastics, I suppose. I'll just say plastics. I like to cast it out, let it yep, sink okay. down, um, yep. but give it a couple of short flicks every now and then, not overwork it. On jigs, I like to work jigs slow for snap. Like I'm talking like slow, like just lift and fall, and just especially that slow pitch jigging where you just do half a turn and one turn and what's interesting is most of the biggest snapper i've caught on plat on jigs the bites really tend to give it's like a flathead nibbling away at it or some picker fish nibbling away it's not very often that they slam the jig they just tend to like tap it and then load up on it so um which is interesting because then when they eat a live slimy apple or something they smash it but they mm. destroy it so um but look i know a lot of guys who catch a far far more snapper than i do on lures every year especially up the coast Basically, you cast the plastic out, if you're fishing plastics, and you put the rod in the holder and you're able to let it sink down. And the trick's to have it sinking slowly, so a lighter jig head. That seems to be more of the key, is, is a, a slow fall rather than a retrieve style. Okay. And, and Matthew's actually posted another question a bit later on, so I think you've actually hit the nail yep. right on the head there, Lee. Cool. So let and us know, one, Matt, if you've covered that. The other one too, though, 
Matt, is if there's two of you fishing and you're both jigging, have one guy fishing a slow pitch jig, you know, fishing really slow, and have the other guy fishing, you know, more of just your, your smaller flutter jigs, but fishing that one faster because they vary day to day as well. There's no point both people fishing the same methods. Don't fish the same colours. Like, we always mix it up. Like, I love my pinks and my oranges for snapper. But if there's two of us jigging, one will fish a, a bright colour and one will fish a really natural colour. Mm. And they both have their days. Excellent. All right. Let's have a look at another question. So, Lee, can you please provide some information on which frequency, yep. a high chirp 200 kilohertz, low chirp 50 kilohertz, medium chirp with respect to depth and speed of travel? Mm. Okay. So there's so many factors I think more so to that, like it's your boat set up, it's obviously water depth and stuff like that. So, um, you know, high chirp is, is your, your set up for, for shallower water. Saying that, if I go high chirp and 50 kilohertz, and this is the thing, you can play around with all this sort of stuff. The 50 kilohertz is a very narrow beam, but it gives you a very, very good picture. So if you've got a Western Port situation or, say, down that part of Morton Bay where you've got your tide and all that sort of stuff, then that's where that 50 will really come into its own. In Port Phillip Bay, you're 200 where you have no tide, you get a wider beam, it picks up the detail. Mm. So um, you're going to find different scenarios where it's all going to be relevant. But generally speaking, your low chirp 50 is better for deeper water, your high chirp 200 for your shallower, and then your medium is your medium. Yeah, excellent. All right, so we've a uh, question from uh, uh, who we got here, Ishvac. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of Lua I think we've already touched on that, but you might want yeah. to elaborate, Lee. Yeah, oh, look, I like my pinks and my oranges and stuff like that, but it's going to vary where you whereabouts in the country you fish, I think. Mm. Um, I know a lot of guys love white up, up yep. the coast, up in New South Wales and stuff. White's a great colour. And I think snapper are a bit of a visual fish as well. Like it definitely seems that way. There's something that, you know, if it stands out, they're probably a little bit inquisitive on that. So um, I my go-to, Greg, if, if it's a lure, it generally has a bit of pink in it for snapper. They seem to like a little bit of pink in it. There you go. And mine, mine's white. If it's, uh, Is it? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah. So a uh, question from Stephanie made about whether you do tutorials on boat. Yep. Uh, I'm starting to get into doing that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's that's the next phase and next year. Um, yeah, definitely. Because this is people... Yeah. People have the gear, they want to know how to use it and get the, I suppose, those little one percenters that make it all work better. Yep, get in touch with Lee via social media. Um, yeah, that's no problem. We'll do, uh, want, want to find out more about that, yep. Yep. So we've got Adrian Bibby. So uh, let me just scroll down here so I can actually read it. If we can get out into Port Phillip Bay this year, I'd like to try some, some of my homemade hard bodies. Well done, mate. Good to hear. Oh, that's cool. What size and action would you recommend? Uh, you said they feed higher up. Would shallow divers work at one to two metres? Uh, look, they would if the fish are up there, but generally speaking, um, anything in Port Phillip Bay, generally anything mid-water to the bottom is is where you tend to find the fish. You, you will find them up higher and you will catch them up higher and I've caught them trolling for salmon. But, um, look, I love if I'm fishing around Port Phillip Bay and you're fishing in, in six or eight metres of water, I love a little diver that dives, you know, nine to 12 feet, you know, the little extra 10 is a perfect lure for that. So I've caught lots and lots of snapper on extra 10, even out in, in, you know, 10 metres of water. So um, the other one too, Greg, a lot of guys here troll cold lures as well. Not mm. the kayaks, a lot of them pull cold lures. So, um, and I, I've trolled them around a little bit, but I do personally just love my real nice bait fishy looking stuff like your extra or your lucky crafts and stuff like that. So. Um, some of the smaller pacemakers from Samaki that Josh makes, they've, they've caught a lot of snapper as well. So, um, yeah, mix it up. That's the that's the main tip I can give. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Peter uh, is asking, is there a way to get rid of sea lice on the sound? I know there is, mate, because we've talked about this already yeah. Yeah. in the podcast. So uh, in Port Phillip Bay, heaps of uh, arches in the dark and the sound, but nothing once the sun's up. Yeah, that's it. So the, the sea lice come out of the mud in the dark on the moon and eat your baits and do all that. And definitely, that is where you need to um, you need to go to a set frequency. You know, you can run your high chirp, but also run fifty or two hundred. But generally, fifty in that scenario, it basically cuts the crap. It gets rid of the sea lice, and you will mark because the snapper is still there. There's no problem at all. The snapper is still there. Um, you just need to be able to find them. So. You go to your 50 and you, you may have to do a little bit more sounding because you're not throwing wider beam, so you can easily miss the fish. But um, 
when you mark them, you'll mark them. You will have absolutely no doubt in your mind when you mark them. That's for sure. And if you if not, run your run your um, chirp right. Run your sensitivity down because otherwise you're going to pick up every bit of rubbish. Right. Run your colour really high. Okay. And then if you get some sort of like little weak return, then you can quickly just bump the gain the gain up, and you'll you'll go. There's a fish there. So that's the other option that you can do as well. Yeah, good stuff. We'll answer this one very quickly. And then what I'd like to do, Lee, is zap over and have a look at some screenshots because we're nearly an hour into this masterclass. Oh, well, Michael's you. asking where you can see the podcast, Greg. Yeah. Or here's so the Michael podcast. Michael's asking where you can see the podcast. So, if, Michael, if you zap over to doclures.com, D O C L U R E S.com, it's episode 275. So it'll be the top one on the list there. Um, and Lee and I have a pretty good chat there about targeting snapper in Western Port and Port Phillip Bay. So, lots of great information there. So, Lee, let's pull up one of your screenshots because yep. uh, we need to give you a little bit of a breather for a second. No, you're right. And, uh, and have a bit of a chat about some of talking. talking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, am I, so am I, mate, surprisingly. Yeah. So, uh, is this is just a brag shot, mate, or what are we No, this is, so this is my mate, Tim. This is out of Port Welsh Pool or Corner Inlet. And hmm. a couple of things going on here. That is a classic Gippsland looking snapper. Like it's got the nose, it's got the big mm. tail, the big mouth, the whole lot, and, and the fish does as well. Um, <laughs> so, no, that's that's like a classic fish. That was about nine kilos, that one. Um, but you'll see too that thing hanging out of its mouth, Greg. That's one of those like rubber skirts that I was talking about, mm. the snapper mm. snack. So, um, yeah, so that's just, you know, that's what everyone wants to catch. I remember as a kid, it's all I wanted to catch was a big snapper and a big mulloway. You know, they're just they're just a fish. They look so good when they come up next to the boat. I don't think anyone gets sick of seeing a big snapper pop up, that's for sure. You, you never get bored of seeing that colour when they come nah. up alongside the boat, do you? No, you don't. Right. And especially those ocean fish with those blue through their fins and stuff, yep. they're just the best. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's have a look at some screenshots here. Okay. So so this is, a, this is actually off a of Larance unit. So um, just sort of throw this one in to mix it up a little bit. But you click quickly, you quickly hear um, that you see that there's bait. You'll see that there's bait. Sorry, kids are fighting. Um, <laughs> so you see that there's a lot of bait here, but then off to the right-hand side of the screen, you're actually starting. And there's a few fish to the left, but you're clearly starting to mark um, fish sitting hard in the bait here on the right-hand side of the screen. I think I'd also adjust the sensitivity by that point as well. We're running 50 kilohertz. Scroll speed is normal, and I like to run just a normal scroll speed. The faster your scroll speed, the, the more flatter the arch is going to be, um, the more flatter the arch is going to be, and also my ping speed is quite high, so that's the amount of pulses that are going down. So um, it's a pretty clear picture. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of bait but there's also a few fish there, especially that right-hand side of the screen. And you can see they're sitting up on the, on that bait as well too. They're not actually on the bottom. They're sitting up on that bait, pushing it around a bit. And, and you can also see the uh, the structure or the lack of structure, obviously. Yeah, totally. Yeah, Port so Phillip Bay at its finest. Here you've got, yeah, bait over a, a flat yeah, bottom. Over a mud bottom, yeah. And a lot of the bait in the bay is just pilchards and white bait and tiny little yep. bottle squid and stuff like that. So. Yep. Um, so yeah, and this is this is the thing with Port Phillip Bay. The fish move around, you know, like cattle in a paddock. So yep. you, you need to be prepared to move with them. Yep, absolutely. All right. Well, I like this one. So this one here. So we're running 200 kilohertz, uh, fairly cold water, and this this is showing you a lot of detail. So obviously we've got what we've got is big bait and small bait. You've got this time the small bait that's just marking up as little dots and specks, but then there's also bigger bait that's actually showing sort of as arches and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So um, in this case, the the small bait would have probably been white bait, the bigger bait, the little yappers or slimies and stuff like that. The water's not overly warm at 16 and a half, 16.6 degrees, which is, you know, that's sort of the trigger point in Port Phillip Bay, it seems, and even Western Port, you get that 16 degree water and the fish start to feed. So, but what's interesting, Greg, is right there in that middle of the screen there, you can clearly see two big fish sitting up off, you know, sitting up on, on the bait, that's for sure. So, and those are the fish that as a lure fisherman you get excited about. I was going to say, yeah, only, you, only one reason for those fish to be there. Exactly, exactly. They're there, they're feeding. They're, you know, that, that little ball of bait that's on its own, that's what I like too, you know, rather than the massive pile of bait, I love that little little broken off piece on its own because it's it's much easier for one or two fish to try and hold 100 bait fish than it is to try and hold 10,000. Mm, so okay. that's what they've done there. They've cracked them off. They've got them on their own. If you're lure fishing, 
perfect. If you're jigging, drop that jig straight down on them and you'll often get the bite. If you're bait fishing, because those fish are sitting up basically about three metres off the bottom, it's time to take the sinkers off and get those baits floating down and keep working those baits. So just let them sit on the bottom for 15, 20 minutes. When they hit the bottom, give them a minute or two, wind them up and then sink them back down again because those fish those fish are not on the bottom, so don't fish your baits on the bottom. Uh, I'm just going to bring up a, a question, speaking of bait, Lee, that, uh, that came up a little while ago. So what's a more effective bait, freshly caught or frozen? Does it vary with conditions? Oh, look, I think, I think it's very hard to go past fresh bait. In anywhere in the world, isn't it? But, you know, fresh squid or whatever. But saying that, frozen pillies account for probably more snapper in Port Phillip Bay than anything. Um, I think that the quality of your bait is so important, Greg, you know, to make sure your bait is good. You know, there's, I have no problem at all pulling squid out of my freezer. I've caught heaps of mullow and frozen squid and big snapper and that, but it's well looked after. A couple mm. of tips. Um, buy your bait fresh, okay? And, and a lot of the bait you get from your bait shops is very, very good because it's actually packed straight away. Everyone goes, I'm going to the market and buy my bait from the market. That bait could have come in four days ago yeah. and it's just been sitting on ice. So unless yeah, you're getting the bait... It could have come in from Vietnam and been treated with chemicals too. Well, so. that's true, yeah. But, like, if your bait, if you're getting your bait from the market, you want to be there on the day that the bait arrives, then it's fresh. Okay, if you're there a couple of days later, it's it's not that fresh. So, um, look, pillies are obviously a wonderful bait for snapper and probably every fish in the ocean. Um, if you're getting your own bait, a couple of tips, don't ever let your bait touch fresh water. I reckon that's the biggest thing that, that wrecks people's bait mm -hmm. is fresh water. So, yeah. um, look, I have no problem at all pulling squid three or four months, five months old out of the freezer and, and confidently using that to catch fish. Obviously, wherever possible, we use fresh bait. But, you know, that is that is a big key to catching. And certainly your bigger fish, I think, they love the fresh stuff, that's for sure. Yep. So a question here from Mark about what snapper looked like on the side scan. I don't, have we got any side scan? I haven't got any shots? side scan no. shots, no. I don't have any side scan shots. It's sort of like a stretched out blob, if that makes sense, like a jelly beanie sort of shape, I suppose. Um, but you generally know because you've got a good shadow. Um, you generally know because there's a pretty solid shadow behind them, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So. All right. Let's just zap back to our screenshots for a moment. What have we got here? So this one here is high okay. chirp. Um, and this one here shows, this is in Western Port, and you've got um, a lot of stuff going on. This is what your chirp does. So see, yeah, you've got lots and lots of marks and scratches and looks like lots of tiny little fish zipping around everywhere. But you've obviously got one very clear snapper in the middle on some rough mm. bottom. You can see that bottom going up and down. So uh, we're running two times zoom there. So we've got a pretty good picture of what's going on. Um, and, and the colour's fairly high on this. This is an older screenshot, but the colour's fairly high. So we've got rough bottom just with one nice big fish in that scenario there. Hmm. That's your classic shot there, I think, Greg. There you go. That's Port Phillip Bay, and you've got two big snapper sitting on the mud just doing that, just sitting there on the mud doing their thing. And that, if I was fishing, and I obviously was fishing, that gets me excited, just seeing two fish sitting like that. That's what I stop on. Absolutely love that. Sitting hard on the bottom, probably doing their thing, nose down, feeding, doing whatever they're doing. So that's a, the classic example of what we were talking about earlier on with the um, you know snapper being like cattle, that they're, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, you've got a couple of lone fish there, they're out feeding. Yes. Uh, so it's a good, uh, good time to be fishing. So a uh, question from Andrew about, do you use sonar chart live or Genesis mapping for finding new ground? What would you recommend? <sighs> I do like Genesis mapping. Your people have done it, um, but that sonar live stuff very good too. Um, so they've, they've both got their place, but that Genesis mapping because it's, you know, guys have been over it and done it and it's, it's seen it right there. And, yeah, so I think Genesis mapping is good, that's for sure. I think they're both good. Now, I know you're going to love this question, mate. It's all about trolling with hard bodies, using yep. a down rig. It's something we talked about again earlier on today. So what's the ideal distance to run the lure behind the downrigger ball? Okay, so I do... Quickly, I'll go through. I do like a lure that dies below my bomb because a snapper do not like downrigger bombs at all. They're not a kingfish or a snapper trout or whatever. So I like a lure that dies below the bomb. I like a lure that I know what depth it runs. So I tend to run, say, a Rapala Rack Trap 10 because I know it dies, dies 10 foot below my bomb and I put it about 10 metres behind the bomb. So let the lure out about 10 metres with your multicoloured braid, let it out one colour, put the line in the clip, 
and then send it down. And then you know that that fluid is diving 10 foot behind, 10 foot below the bomb. You're in 60 foot of water, you run the bomb down 45 foot, the lure is going to run at 55 foot, your lure is five foot off the bottom. It's a nice, simple sort of formula. Yeah, and as you were saying earlier on as well, keep it a little bit off the bottom, otherwise you're going to pick yeah. up all the flathead. <laughs> yeah, you do get way too many flathead. What a target staff would just keep it a little bit yeah. higher. And, and also run the, the clip pretty hard, which we were talking mm. about too. Greg, I like to run the clip yeah. hard because I like to use that to sort of help set the hook as well. Yep, yep. So. Uh, so a lengthy question here from Andrew. He fishes the top end of Western Port and he's found some areas around the mangroves in less than two metres. Yep. Like the flats on high tide around Blind Bite. So many people fish deep where they're in the shallows. Any thoughts or experiences as they do target them that way in New Zealand? Yeah, they, those fish are getting up on the flats. That's what they're doing. And if they're not there, the mulloway there and everything's there. There's no no problem. I haven't fished for them in two metres of water, but I've caught them in three and four metres. So I don't see that why they wouldn't be in two metres, that's for sure. So um, certainly, I don't. water can't be too shallow for snapper. And, and they prove it time and again in New Zealand. And again, those flats in Western Port are full of food. They're, they're basically big bass yabby beds. They're covered in crabs. There's... Um, flounder and mullet and all that sort of stuff there. So certainly, yeah, worth fishing the shallow water. And, and the best thing is if you can have two metres of water with a drop-off nearby, you know, that's where the fish, they will come up out of those drop-offs onto the flats. They, they need, obviously, a quick, easy escape route, that's for sure. Yeah, like most predators, deep water is not too far away, generally yeah, speaking. exactly, yeah. exactly. A uh, good question from Ross as well about what's your preferred boat speed when you're uh, sounding in Port Phillip Bay looking for snapper? Look, the great thing about the units these days, you can sound faster, and that is mm. that is one big, big asset, that's for sure. So, you know, years ago, we basically were going as slow as we could to try and get the best reading we could. Now, we sound around at, you know, 12, 15 k's an hour, no problem at all. Obviously, it's going to depend on conditions. Um, but, you know, just to, I suppose, you said 10 k's an hour, that's sort of perfect. 8 k's an hour is sort of perfect just to poke around if it's rough you know you, you're obviously going to go slower if you want to get the best reading in rough weather run down sea that's the best way to get the boat to run nice and smooth mm -hmm. and you'll get the best reading so um but it's going to depend on setup too you know i know i can sound quite fast in my boat and other guys can't sound as fast in their boat and it's all just transducer setup you can generally sound much faster if you've got a through hole transducer than a transom mount so you've got all these factors you just need to do what's best for you Yep, excellent. Um, so a question about fishing the shallows. Yep. I want to come up on the screen. Where is it? Here we go. So when you're fishing the shallows, the snapper, is it better to drive over an area and sound up the fish or to throw lures or baits into areas that you haven't been over so as not to scare the fish? Uh, look, if, you can, if you're confident enough to get into your area and just anchor up, do it, obviously. Um, I, I always like to try and, though, if I'm in shallow water, um, I do like to come in at the best angle. So it's, if I'm in an area that I think I'm going to find the fish, I'd like to come in, you know, with the sea or with the tide so that the boat's running smoother and I can have the I can have less, less revs on the engine. I can be just in gear, you know, rather than pushing into the tide or pushing into the wind. Um, so I'm making the least amount of noise possible. When I find something, don't go circling around over it and check it again and again and again. Just go, oh, that's it, mark it on the GPS get out of there, get upwind or up current, drop the peak or drop, you know, do whatever you've got to do and get yourself in position. All right. Lee, when you're, when you're trolling snapper, are you um, on the main motor or are you on the electric motor? Uh, no, I'm on the big motor if I need yeah. to be. With a sand crowd, if I need to be, obviously if you've got a smaller boat with an electric, then that's even better. Um, you know, especially jigging too. If you've got your small boat these days or on the motor guide, you know, and if you can use the anchor function when you mark something, you just anchor and it just sits the boat right there on top of the fish. That's Perfect, so, yeah. so. Lee, I'm gonna, we've got plenty of questions coming, guys. We, we're not ignoring them. We will come back to them. But I'm going to jump over to some screenshots again for just a moment. Yep. Um, and, and that'll give Lee a chance while the, uh, you know, the screens, he's not on the screen, he can wave at his kids and, and instead of kids with kids and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and, but let's have a look at some screenshots and we will come back, folks, and answer all of your questions before we finish up. So, Lee, what have we got going on here, mate? Okay. Obviously, a couple of good fish here. So this is a perfect scenario. So, poor fellow bait, a little bit of structure. 
um, whatever it may be, probably, you know, um, one of those native fridges or who knows, whatever people tend to drop in the bay. But um, <laughs> you've got a bunch of small snappers sitting on the structure, right? But what's exciting about this one is off there to the right-hand side of the screen, you have that one big fish sitting on his own. And this refers back to, Greg, what we were talking about before, yep. the big fish sitting off the structure, okay? Mm -hmm. And a lot of guys will drive over the structure and mark little fish like that or mark not a lot and then go, oh, no, there's nothing there. What I like to do is basically like a spiral out off the structure and sound around and around and around getting wider and wider, um, you know, or do, you know, do passes over it. But I, I'll go 100 metres off the structure and quite often the big fish, you know, will be sitting 50 to 100 metres away from where the, the, the big structure is. So don't don't think that if you don't mark them on the structure that they're not there. Yeah, cool, cool. All right. What's this, this all about? One here, this one here is just, um, again, you've got a bit of a rise in the bottom. You've got so a bit of hard reef there. You've got a bit of scattered bait to the right-hand side, but on the left-hand side there, you've got that column of bait. So this was tiny little slimy mackerel, okay, and you've got two nice snapper pushing that bait. That's what they're doing. So that's, mm -hmm. again, perfect scenario if you're a lure fisherman, but also bait fishing. Um, but you've got a good, a good sequence of events here. You've got bait, you've got fish, and you've got structure being, and it's natural structure. You can see that sort of rise in the bottom mm -hmm. in the screen there. So it's a really sort of great scenario to find yourself in. Everything's everything's good. And you've got 17 degree water, which is even better. And I'm guessing that the, the tide's moving from left to right on this screen. Uh, I suppose so. <laughs> well, I'm just assuming the fish and the bait are up current of the of Yeah, the yeah. Yes, the for sure. assumption yeah. that I've made there. Yeah, for sure. All right. So here we go. So this is Western Port, 21 metres of water. We've obviously got some up and down bottom, right? So on the left hand, we've got 18 degree water, so it's ideal for snapper, right? We've got on the left hand side of the screen, we've got the high chirp, okay? And you can clearly see there's a lot going on. So the sound, the chirp's just picking up a lot of detail, okay? And while it's marking the fish on the bottom there at the middle of the screen, right? That's it's just a little scratch. We've got 50 kilohertz running on the opposite side, and yes, I've got a two time zoom, but you can see there's not as much clutter on the screen, and you can see that there's actually three snapper there. There's not yep. one, but there's yep. three. Two clear marks, but then there's also more to the left hand side. There's a vertical, more of a vertical line on its own. That's a snapper. Yep, yep. So, um, yeah, so that's and that's the. I think that just clearly shows the difference between running your high chirp and your low chirp and variable frequencies and stuff like that. Um, yep. And you can clearly see I'm running a fair bit of colour there as well, and that fair bit of colour is is what's what's helping to define those snapper. That's for sure. So what what was causing the noise and the clatter in the high chirp on that particular? Oh, look, I think in Western Port because you've got this tide and stuff like that. I think you've got. Um, there's just a lot of factors, Greg. You've got weed, you've got sediment in the water at times, like it's not generally crystal clean water. There's there's air bubbles, there's just a lot, you know, just general flowing water. I think that creates, you know, those these high chirp transducers are so good that they pick up all that stuff. I think yep. that's just part of it. They're just that good. Yep. Yep. So yeah, it's a it, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah, it is. But but it, how good is it that now you can run dual frequencies like yeah, who would have ever thought yeah. that you could run high chirp and 50 kilohertz it would that's just like it's stupid to be able to do that sort of stuff yeah, game changing it. game changing it stuff. yeah and it's with the press of a button and you know you can set your screen up you know you go into your menus on your setup page and you just you can actually drag and drop and drag and make your own screens and do all that and, and i can do it so it's easy <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're talking yourself down, mate. We know you're pretty smart. Oh, All right, so, so Theo's asking, is there anything on the market you can use to wipe clean a transducer screen? So he's got a uh -huh. through-hole SS1751, 175i, yep. trans, transom mount total scan tranny. Yep. Um, I've never wiped clean my transducer with anything other than soapy water. So... Um, but, you know, it's worth keeping an eye on them, that's for sure. I wouldn't probably use anything harsh on them. You know, I, I wouldn't go putting some harsh chemical. Look, I just find warm soapy water, you know, with a good a good wash and wax is, is the best thing for cleaning sounders, boats, trailers, the whole the whole lot. So I just like to, to use that sort of stuff. Again, I don't. I wouldn't be putting harsh chemicals on, on, onto my transducers, that's for sure. The, the, if there's something that particular that's 
um, clogging up your transducer, let us know because there might be some mm. advice we can give. I mean, yes. I know that you know if you're in the mangroves a lot, often there's that oily sort of film that comes oh, from the yeah. mangroves that can coat hulls and, and transducers. But usually, warm soapy water will take that off if it's you know that, that big a deal. Yeah. Um, but let us know if there's something, and maybe we can refer you to the Simrad guys for some advice if we don't have the answer. So. Let me just scroll through, Lee, see if we've got some more questions here. So a question from Clint about what's the best rig for snapper fishing in Port Phillip Bay? Probably most people would run a two-hook rig, you know, uh, generally a snell rig, so that the two hooks fixed on a leader of 30 to 50 pound, you know, with a swivel and a ball sinker. What I do like to run, though, Greg, is I like to run a little ball sinker between the hooks and the swivel, not above it. Okay. Because some weird stuff goes on in the bay and there's just enough tide that your sinker tends to slide up the line and twist around and do all this weird stuff. So, and also because we run multiple rods and we cast them out around the back of the boat, right, you find that when you cast, if your leader's a little bit long, the ball sinker slides up the line and you just can't cast as well. But yep. having the ball sinker sitting down onto the bait, it's much easier to cast. You can just basically give it a flick and it will go much further. So what length of lead would you have between the swivel and the hooks with that ring? Uh, three foot. Okay. Not long. Not long. Yeah. So um, Enough though that the fish can, if the ball sink is down on the bait, the fish can pick it up and, and carry it a small distance without picking yeah, up the weight. Yeah, definitely. We're using pretty small sinkers in Port Phillip Bay. Well, anyway. Look, yeah, we're using pretty small sinkers. And, and even yeah. at the point, some guys go, oh, you know, sinker or no sinker, you go, mate, the pilchard weighs more than the sinker. Yeah. So, <laughs> so let's not get too fussy. Um, so yeah, look, generally it's a size one ball sinker. That's about most common size that, that people use. So it's not an overly big piece of lead, but it does help. It does help. So um, I do like to fish baits as well without sinkers as well. So, mm. but generally two hook snell rig is the most popular import for a bait. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, so Michael's made a comment that he believes that water with, with a bit of chop tends to produce bigger fish and calmer glassing conditions tend to produce less fish. What's yeah. your opinion on that? Oh, look, without doubt. Without doubt. Look, if there's, you have those glamour days when it's glass calm and you catch big fish, but for the most part, I think, most fishing scenarios, rough weather gets the fish by. I think they lose their inhibitions a bit more. Um, I think it just it changes it generally when you've got – a bit of wind, you've got a, the right barometer. It just makes stuff different. The, there's m probably the noise as well. There's all the, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot mm. of factors. But mm. you know, wind direction has a lot to do with fish biting. And, and down here in Port Phillip Bay, I hate Norwood. You used to always talk about easterlies, and you know, wind from there's fish bite the least down here, but can't stand Norwood, and that's to do with air pressure and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. but generally speaking, a bit of wind is good. All right, I'm going to flick past this one definitely to you, Lee. So what's the biggest difference you've found with snapper fishing up the coast as far as Queensland compared to fishing down in Port Phillip Bay? Um, so in Queensland, the fish are super predators, northern New South Wales and everywhere. Those the fish are just big predators. They're offshore, they're on hard reef and, you know, they're ocean fish and they, they chase bait fish flat sticks. So, um, yeah, that, that's a big difference and I think, up there, the fish love to get really high in the water column. In Port Phillip Bay, they, they do tend to sit more on the bottom to mid water, that's for sure. So, um, and the fish down in Port Phillip, we catch plenty on lures, Greg, but not like you do up the coast. You know, and certainly jigging, it doesn't seem to be as effective here as it is up in that part of the world. So, okay. yep. you, you do have different sorts of scenarios. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, what have we got here? So can your transducer overheat if it's not in the water? I don't think it's good to leave them running. Um, I know I freak out every time I realise I've forgotten to turn the sounder off when you stand back with it. What's that ticking sound? <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, they, they do get hot. Um, hmm. I think it would probably have to be on for a while for it to do damage, but certainly I would I would make it a habit of, of leaving them on out of the water, that's for sure. So Because yeah, yeah. uh, they pump a lot of power these days, you know. A lot of power. And one from David. I'm not sure why it's showing a bit funny on the screen. There, what's the ideal speed for sounding? Slower the better or covering ground? Um, it, it's going to matter on your boat. I think we sort of touched on this before, Greg. It's, going yeah. to, it's really going to depend on your boat and your setup. So, um, you know, your boat might pick, be able to sound faster than my boat. So, But generally speaking, a, a solid walking pace through to a jog. You know, the slower your sound, the better your read's going to be. 
there is no doubt. There is no doubt. So, but then saying that in Port Phillip, when you're out on the mud and you've got endless kilometres of water that you could be potentially finding snapper in, it does hurt to be poking around really, really slow. So, um, these days the bonus with the Simrad unit is that you can you can get the sound a lot faster. That's for sure. But when I get into an area that might look good, you, know, you start to mark a bit of bait or a mark a fish straight away. I slow down. I do slow down just to then get a real good read. Yep. Yep. So a question from Michael, uh, dragon snapper are quickly becoming a target species. Have you got any advice for sounding those guys up? Mm, no, no. <laughs> What's a dragon snapper? <laughs> Give us a bit that? more information, Michael. Where, where are you targeting those? I, I got a feeling they might be a very deep water species, but... Um, yeah. Um, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah I, haven't, I haven't targeted them. I don't know anything about them, so... Um, so right. Ray, I oh know Ray Karuna. Um, Ray's asking how fast would we troll for snapper in Port Phillip Bay? The question is that the answer is slow. Yeah, I've got most of mine just slow. So just like a just walking pace, you know, fast walking pace, that's about it. I, don't, I haven't caught them trolling quick, that's for sure. So, and in fact, I think I mentioned in the podcast, Greg, I've had it when you've got two down riggers and you, you know, you've got one fish on one. And you're fighting that fish, and the boat's out of here, and it's hardly moving. Like I'm talking, last out conditions, hardly moving. And then the second lure gets eaten. So, and again, they show that by they like a plastic that's just slowly sinking through the water. They like a jig that's just basically sitting in the rod holder. They like stuff that's just, you know, not too active. Yeah, yeah. All right, one final question from Michael, I think, uh, before we go and have a look at some more screenshots. So, Michael's question is if my boat's sinking and I'm tied into a 10 kilogram snapper, what do I do? keep fighting the snapper <laughs> <laughs> you can always swim back to shore and get another boat mate it's fine. Yeah. I'll, the rod in, I'll the rod in one hand and wave with the other so i'm going to come and get you <laughs> uh and sam this is the final question that we've got on the list but we'll go back to some screenshots in a moment to give you, give you guys a chance to put a few more questions in but can you catch fish in gentlemen's hours you certainly can you certainly can and some of the best snapper fishing you know especially in november and Early December in Port Phillip Bay, some of the midday bites that we get are just stupid. You know, middle of the day, hot sun, fish chew their heads off. Um, and saying that too, again, it comes down to your tide change. If you've got something that's making the fish bite, you know, is the, if the water temperature's right, the fish are just active, that's for sure. So um, certainly you catch snapper all day. Dawn and dusk are obviously great. If you're like me, you don't like getting out of bed, I'll take the Arvo session more than the morning session. <laughs> Sometimes they like that warmer water, mate. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And well, that's a factor as well. Yep. Yep. Let's go. We've already seen this screenshot. Do we want yep. to no, keep, going. No, keep, keep moving? Going. All right. Keep moving. So that's just a snapper and a micro jig. And you'll clearly see there what's interesting with micro jigs is a lot of the fish that I've caught, you tend to find the, the hooks and it's done there. There's one set, one of the hooks is under his chin and one's in his lip. And, and it sort of seems to be a fairly common theme um, versus when you're, you know, often a plastic, they smash it and they, slip, they suck it right in, whereas the jigs, they tend to just tap away at them and, you know, tap away and tap away. And when you hook them, they're, they're hooked in the lips. And for this reason, I don't go pulling as hard as I can anymore on my jig tackle because you just tend to rip the hooks out of the fish. So just fight them like a normal fish and you'll be fine. So this one here. This one here, Greg, that's a whole bunch of smaller fish. We've got a bit of structure there and just two bigger fish sitting off to the side of them. Um, and, again, that's that's a pretty good scenario to find. We've got, although the water temp is very, very cold, so this would have been early or late season. So, mm. um, And, again, you'll see I'm, I'm going really slow because I've, I know there's a bit of structure there, which is clearly on sort of the right-hand, the left-hand part of the screen. There's a bit of structure on the bottom. Um, so I'm sounding really, really slow just to probably just pull the boat even out of gear as I've gone over those fish just to, to get the best read I can and try and get the best definition I can because it's, it's cold water and the fish are not that active. Excellent. So this one here, that one gets you excited. You've got a fish on the bottom. You've got a column of bait that's deep red in colour. So even if I wasn't marking a fish there, which we are, that's sitting up sort of at 16 metres, he's a few metres off the bottom, even if I wasn't marking a fish there, Greg, I'd be pretty excited just by the, the density of that patch of bait there being yeah. red. Yeah. They've been they've been rounded up, they've been squashed yeah. together. <laughs> and it's flat. See how the bait's flat, flat on, on the side where the arch yeah. is? It's yeah. flat. That means that fish is pushing that bait. So the other one I think people need to realise, you don't always mark the fish because he's only got to just be missed by that transducer beam. 
But if you mm. mark that, you could go, there's something going on there because of the, the density of the bait. Excellent. All right. Now, I have a feeling we might be getting towards the end of our slide deck, mate. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So this one here, Greg, that I've put in is quite simply. So someone asked earlier about if you just run in auto. The great thing is you can run, you can override your auto. So I've got the mm. auto at plus three. Okay, so I've overridden what, what the standards, the, the factory setting would have come into at this scenario. But what's interesting here is we've got one, two, you've got three, you've got two good marks there. So two fish sitting very close together. You've got one mark that's okay, but there's another two fish sitting there and it's a very weak return. So we've actually got five fish there in that, in that shot. Those two really weak returns, if I pump my gain up, I would mark them much better. So. Yeah. This is a classic example of, of tweaking your sound. If you see something, like if you mark just those two two really light returns, which are there in between the, the more solid returns, if I mark those and I go, I reckon that's a fish, I'll pump my gain up straight away. And yes. also go, oh, there's a fish there. So always be prepared and always be playing around with your, your sound to get the best out of it in this scenario here. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Let me just see if we've got one more. No, that's it, mate. We that's are it. done and dusted as far as our screenshots go. Cool. I'll turn that off. I'll bring us back on. We do have a couple more questions, so let me just um, scroll back up through and find them. Um, so questions about burling. So would you use a burly bomb on Snapper in, I think that's supposed to be Western Port? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to use a thing called a secret weapon. You ever seen those, Greg? The no, red I cylindrical I haven't. thing. It's a trapdoor. So because okay. you've got, you got the tide in, in Western Port, um, and I like a chunk burly for my snapper rather than a fine burly in most cases. So yep. these things, they're a foot long, cylindrical, and basically got a big flap on them. And you load them up, you get about two big handfuls of burly into them, shut the thing. They're heavy, and you drop them down on a rope. When they hit the bottom, the trap door falls open. Yeah, it falls out. Yeah. So yeah. I really like using those. I really okay. like using those. So, I'm familiar with the concept. I haven't used that, but I yeah, didn't really, really love them. Them. Brand name. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And even yeah. even if you want to drop them mid water, you just stop it. And even in Port Phillip Bay, we use them a lot. If you want to just get some burly out of the boat, we we'll just drop it down and maybe mid water. You just give it a jolt. The door will open. The burly will fall out, and you're away. Yep, yep. So a couple more questions about the burley. I'll bring them up yep. quickly because they're both along the same line. So Adrian's asking how much burley you'd use and um, the question, how often do you burley and can you over burley? Oh, I think you can over burley because you certainly up, in, up the coast you'll tend to bring in a lot of junk and even in, you know, Western Port and, and Port Phillip and Cantu, but Western Port and Gibbs and down Welsh Port and they start pulling in the rays and all that sort of crap. So, um you start pulling the raising crap. So, um, sorry, the kids are starting to fight again. <laughs> <laughs> we've, been, we've been going a while, mate. They've done no, well. Right. <laughs> They've done well. So, um, you can over -burly. look Like in any burly situation, I just like a good steady stream or just a, you know, just consistent. Just, you know, um, Port Phillip Bay, I like a couple of handfuls every 10 minutes, stuff like that. Um, same thing, Western Port, every 10, 15 minutes, one of those burly bombs, send that down. So, um, yeah, don't like to over the burly though because you do often pull in the junk, and then I know that happens a lot up in New South Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Sam's asking whether you reckon that uh, you metro fishers will be allowed to go fishing by the 19th of October. But, Sam, I did invite um, Dan Andrews along to have a chat about the snapper fishing and when you're going to be able to go, but he's declined, unfortunately. So really? Quite busy at the moment, yeah. yeah. Uh, got a bit on. Look, yeah. I hope so. I, I really, really hope so. So, even now, you know, apparently we can put your boat in if you live within 5Ks of the ramp, but then no one can tell me, but then are you allowed to go anywhere you want? Or if you still got that 5K radius, like, you know, there's just so many grey areas and I don't feel like a $5,000 fine at the moment. So No, the fines are fairly hefty. So Yeah. yeah. Saying so, that, I feel you. sorry for the snapper when we are allowed to go because <laughs> it is going to be an absolute <laughs> circus. You might want to you know, get to the ramp pretty early that day as well. Right, I if you get to, I'll tell you now, down here, Greg, if you get to Patterson River at 4 a.m., you're about two hours too late. Too late, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> All yeah. right, so Adrian's asking about your favourite bait for Port Phillip Bay, mate. My favourite bait is fresh garfish. I love garfish, uh, whole, half, whatever. Saying that, 
Pilchards are great. Silver Whitey. And it's funny, Greg, how the start of the season, Pilly's are definitely number one bait when the water's cold. But then as we roll into November, Silver Whitey and some hard baits like that really start to come into their own. Yep. Yeah. So, right. One final question, mate, and then we're going to let you go and get your sure. kids off the bed. No, so, right. <laughs> when you're sounding, is there a particular way to go? Do you follow a depth contour or do you just go from shallow to deep and vice versa? Um, look, I think it's it's nice to try and map out your area. And it doesn't matter if it's snapping fishing or marlin fishing or whatever. You want to map out where you are. So if we're on a reef system, I want to map out where the high point is on the reef. I want to work out where the edges are of the reef. And then I want to try and work out where the tide's going to be pushing into. So um, that's that's a definite. That is a definite. It'd take a bit of time to, to mark. And use your GPS, you know. Use your GPS and anything that you see that you look think looks all right, mark it, mark it, mark it. You know, you'll quickly work out, you'll plot out where the, the good parts are in whether it's a reef or a channel or or whatever it may be. And in Port Phillip Bay, as I understand it, mate, the, the reefs in there are very small, but they multiply every time there's a hard rubbish collection. They so seem to. I understand it. They seem to. I don't know what's going on. There just seems to be like Fridges and stuff like that. So, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No. So, uh, yeah, but, yeah, that's just how it is. <laughs> There is a couple more questions come up, mate, before we before we sure. wrap it up. If you're if you're good to keep going for just a yeah, sure. so, first, I like this question. Um, I think it's excellent. So, when you're chasing the trophy fish, do you fish differently than when you're chasing the school fish? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so so trophy fish, you'll you'll often fish through the night, or you'll fish. We're finding big fish in shallow water, Greg. You know, and, and generally speaking, if I wanted to catch a big fish in Port Phillip Bay, I will put my time in in shallow water, you know, eight metres or less. Um, same thing, you know, I like big baits, big fish. You know, I like to, to try and just do those probably different things that, that you would you would do to try and target a, a big fish, that's for sure. Um, school fish generally, they're the ones that love to be on the structure. And, yes, you'll catch heaps of big ones. You will catch heaps of big ones on the structure. But generally speaking, we spoke about before, find the edge of a reef system and those big fish will be mooching around the edge of the reef system. Yep, yep. So, All right, mate. Well, what have we got? Two more questions and then we're going to wrap it up. So your opinion on fluoro-coloured jig heads? I think it would probably help. You know, again, it gives them that little bit of spark to the, to the rig, whether it's, you know, bait fishing, it might be a glow bead. We've got the white plastic with a hot pink jig head or a bright green jig head. That, that could make all the difference. It just gives it that little bit of standout that the fish will see. The other one I reckon too, Greg, it gives the fish a, a focal point to aim at. Mm. I reckon that's a big part of it as well on a lot of species, and that's why the, the throat of a you know, hard body lure will be red or, you know, and, yeah. and you get a lot of those bites. It gives the fish a point to aim at, whether it's the weak point on a fish, but it just gives them something to aim at. On squid, they definitely love to hit the head. Where there's these big eyes, it's a it's a point of focus. So I think definitely, yeah, a painted jig head is is a well worth doing on on a little one or, yeah. or a plastic. And very last one, mate. So with set baits, do you use a fighting drag or do you use a light drag and let them run? So in in fishing, there's one thing I can't stand. It's a bit of drag. So if I'm letting the fish run, I let I have the least amount of drag on him that I can. Open bail, if it's a bait runner, it's backed off as hard as it can go. Okay, if I'm fishing strike drag, I'm fishing strike drag. Like I want to bury those hooks. And too many guys, I think, fish a bit of drag and it's not enough to set the hook. So they get that sort of half thing, the rod buckles over a bit and then the fish, like a bit of line comes off the reel and the fish is gone. I want that tip touching the water pretty well. You know, that's what I want to do. If I'm fishing strike drag, like I said, if I'm fishing bait runner, the other trick that I find, a lot of guys don't like bait runner, Greg, they, you know, for that free spool mechanism. Yep. What it, what guys do is they tend to get the bite, the fish are screaming off, they pick the rod up, the fish is going your way at 30 k's an hour, so you strike and you're going your way at 30 or 40 k's an hour and the hooks have got to find their mark really quick. Mm. I used to do that a lot. I used to miss a lot. And there's nothing better than a bait runner going off when you snap a fish and when you sit there and just howl. I love it. So you'll get much better success, leave the rod in the holder, click the reel and ticky. And yep. what it does is it just allows that, that hook to just pull into position, whether it's J-hooks or a circle, 
it just it just does the the fish is swimming away from you anyway you know he's got a bit of momentum going anywhere we use really bloody sharp hooks these days yep. so that method there i was going from a 50 percent hook up rate up to an 80 or 90 percent hook up rate by just leaving the rod in the holder turn the handle click it in gear and you've got him there you go carla yeah. hope that helps you out yes yeah, so hopefully. lee that's it mate the questions have slowed down we've had you talking for an hour and a half mate we really appreciate every minute of that time more importantly we really appreciate all the tips and great advice you've given, all the questions you've answered along the way and the screenshots you've put up today. So thanks so much for coming along and sharing what you know about Snapper in Port Phillip and Western Port Bay and, and using your Simrad to maximum benefit, mate. We really appreciate As all. always. As always, Greg, I love doing this stuff. And hopefully if one person got something out of it, then I've done my job. Oh, I can guarantee that uh, lots of people got lots of things out of it. So thanks very much. And, folks, uh, of course, we are doing another masterclass in another two weeks. We've got Nabil Issa coming on board, and we're going to be talking about Moreton Bay Jewfish. So for those that like their Jewies, uh, that'll be a, a top episode as well. So thanks for coming along and sharing some time with us. Thanks for your great questions and your comments along the way, and we look forward to seeing you in the next one.